the last four weeks, last three weeks, we have been learning about how we are to live our lives of faith through the experiences and the eyes of an important biblical figure, the prophet Elijah. We saw that God provided for his every need and protected him. We have seen how God empowered him to defeat the prophets of Baal, how God empowered him to call upon Israel to make a choice as to who would be their God. We also saw him run away in fear and how God carried him through a time in the wilderness when he was depressed and afraid. That's where we left off last week. This week we are going to turn to how God re-engaged Elijah in a mission and called him to raise up the next generation of the faithful. You might recall, if you watched last week, that we ended at a point where Elijah was in a cave on Mount Horeb. He had met God there, and God had whispered to him in a still, small voice. God's last words to Elijah last week were, What are you doing here, Elijah? Well, this morning... I'm going to share Elijah's reply with you and then how God empowered Elijah and sent him on his way. When God asked Elijah, Elijah, what are you doing here? This is how the prophet replied. He said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. We know that this is the second time that Elijah said those words to God. And they're still a little self-serving. And they still have a little tinge of self-pity in them. But this time, God's reply to Elijah was different. God did not give Elijah permission to discontinue his mission. He did not respond to Elijah by releasing him from his call. He didn't say, okay, you've had a rough time. I'll retire you and find someone else to finish your work. God simply told Elijah to go back to work with these words. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from abel Mahola to succeed you as prophet. So I have to warn you now, the rest of this message can get a little confusing if you don't hear the difference between two of the primary names of which I'll speak. Elijah, with a J, is the prophet we've been talking about now. This will be the fourth week. But he is called to anoint a new prophet who will replace him. And his name is Elisha, with an S-H. It would have been easier if his name was George or something that differed from Elijah. But try to listen closely to what I say because their relationship is central to the rest of this message. You see, after providing Elijah with all he needed, God may have recognized that his prophet, his servant, was tired. When God originally called him, he had called him to do some tough, in-your-face kind of work. He was to warn King Ahab about his wrongdoing. He was to defeat the prophet's of Baal in a spectacular scene that took courage and faithfulness. He was also to tell Israel that they were to make a choice about who they would serve. It was tough prophetic work. And it wore Elijah down. So God's new mission for Elijah was to use Elijah to enable him, God, to complete the work through other people. He told Elijah he would appoint kings, but even more importantly, he told Elijah that he would be appointing someone who would be Elijah's successor, and that is the man who became the prophet Elisha. 
in recommissioning him to a new purpose, God would use Elijah to continue to admonish King Ahab. But basically, he would be providing an example that Elisha would learn from. Elijah was spending his time pouring into the next generation so that the mission could continue after it was his time to go home to God. So this is how the two of them met. I am now leaving 1 Kings and we're going to... um, No, we're still in 1 Kings 19, I'm sorry. The very end of 1 Kings 19. And this is what Elijah did. He obeyed God's command... He re-engaged after a time of wilderness. And this is what the scripture tells us. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Later, Elijah set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. And it's important to note that that initial relationship between them was one of master and servant. Elijah's mission was to pass on the faith and the work of becoming a prophet to Elisha. God loved Elijah enough to recommission him. God had let, know, had, had let Elijah know that he loved him. But God reminded Elijah that the mission was the most important thing. It reminds me, my, one of my first uh, years in the military, I was a uh, company commander of a field artillery battery, and our battalion motto was, mission first, people always. This is kind of like that. God always loves his people, but he does not release us from doing the mission that he hands to us when we're called. Through the Bible, we find a whole bunch of important biblical figures who poured into younger people so that when those important figures ended their time on earth, the mission would continue. God's mission continues beyond the death of the teacher mentor. If we think about it, that's exactly what Moses did when he trained Joshua. It's what Elijah does for Elisha. Jesus taught the disciples and empowered them to do great things after he would ascend to heaven. And when we read the New Testament letters, we know that Paul poured into Titus and Timothy. This is the biblical pattern. As we become older and hopefully a little wiser, we are to use our wisdom and the strength that we have left to empower the next generation to carry on God's work. You know, earlier I mentioned Moses and Joshua. You might recall that Moses displeased God. He did something he shouldn't have done that was prideful, and so God told him, Moses, you're not going to be allowed to go into the promised land. You'll lead the people right up to the edge, but you will never cross over. And then he identified Joshua, who had been faithful, as the one who would actually lead the people across the Jordan into the promised land, a mission that Moses started in God's name and God's power, but never finished. But Joshua, in effect, did the same thing. His time of leading Israel was a prosperous and successful time. But when it neared its end, he gathered the people of Israel together. And he, like Elijah would do later, demanded that they choose which God they would follow. He spoke to them in words from the book of Joshua, chapter 24. Prophetic words then that still matter to us today. This is what he said to the people of Israel. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. But as for me 
and my household, we will serve the Lord. You see, Joshua, Joshua realized and was teaching that the basis of faith in a person begins at home. Not always, but most of the time. The best way to raise up a new generation in the faith is for parents and grandparents and family members and church families to teach children in the ways of God. Joshua understood that the parent-child relationship and the relationships between spouses were relationships where faith could grow. And we are called to remember that today. You know, this type of teaching, this type of calling is some of the most important stuff that we can do as Christians. You know, John Wesley, the, the founder of Methodism, if you will, uh, sort of the father of our denomination, realized this, and he wrote a sermon once. It was called On Family Religion. It was his 94th sermon. And the centerpiece text of that sermon was the one I just read for you that ended with, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And Wesley went to great pains to explain both what household meant and what it meant to serve the Lord. He went on at great length, because John Wesley always went on at great length, about what it meant to serve. And what he said, first, what serving means is that we believe in Jesus. We believe that we are saved by grace through faith and that Jesus died on the cross for us. Jesus needed to be the centerpiece of our faith. And by demonstrating that through our behavior, our words, our actions, others could come to know Jesus. So that was one way of serving. Another way of serving was to always demonstrate a love for God and a priority for God. And following closely on the heels of that great love was love for our neighbor. Wes Wesley also pointed out that one of the ways we serve God is by obeying God through the hard times, through the difficult things, doing the things we don't really want to do, but we really know we need to do. So that's what John Wesley interpreted Joshua's words to mean when he said, we will serve the Lord. But what was interesting to me in reading this sermon by Reverend Wesley is how he defined the household. He defined it in part in 18th century terms. He spoke about how husbands should lead their wives to godly behavior and to the faith. We know in our modern world today that sometimes it works the other way around. Sometimes it is a wife who leads a doubting husband to a stronger faith. But in any case, Wesley identified the relationship between spouses as one of the important relationships within a household. The next relationship he identified was the relationships between parents and their children. And I would say to you, that expands for us as the Christian church here at St. Paul, as we all are um, honorable parents, if you will, to all the children in our midst. We affirm that when we baptize babies and we promise that we will raise them up in the faith and that we will nurture them as a church. At this point in his message, Wesley quoted a proverb that many of us have heard before. Um, the proverb says, and this is from Proverbs 22, Start children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. I like the way the message paraphrase gives us this verse. It says, point your kids in the right direction. When they're old, they won't be lost. You know, that's something that the Christian church, all Christian churches, need to work on today. We know that the youngest generations, when they get to be an age to make their own choices, when they graduate from high school, they go on to college, many drift away, some by choice and just by drifting. We need to find ways to re-engage these young people so that their faith grows and that they raise a new generation of children. 
You know, Wesley went on, though, and he included more people in the household. During his day, lots of households had servants. Some were indentured, some were hired. And what Wesley taught was that those servants should also be raised up in the faith. And even more, any stranger within your gates became part of your household when they were in your home. And they should also be trained up in the ways of the faith. And you might wonder, how, how, what would that look like today? And I can give you an example that happened in my own life and surprised me a lot. Um, I had a young man who was an electrician come to my condo not too long ago. I needed to have a ceiling fan installed. And the room in which he was going to install that ceiling fan had a paint-by-number kit painting that I had finished, which was a picture of Jesus where he's holding out the lamp, the one where he's being referred to as the light of the world. And this fellow was working on my uh, fan, and I was paying attention to what he was doing because I don't know very much about installing things and doing things in the home. So I'm probably underfoot and in the way of people who come in. But I, I saw him, as I was watching him do this work, several times look over toward this painting on the wall of Jesus. And when he was done, he looked at it and he said, did you paint that? And I quickly admitted that I didn't have an artistic bone in my body and that, in fact, that was a paint-by-numbers kit. He proceeded to tell me how, after he graduated from high school, he went to college for a year, didn't like college, was now working and beginning to uh, think about marriage to a woman that he loved, and he was concerned that he had drifted away from the church. I told him about our church. I've never seen him join us because um, we've been worshiping virtually. But you know, God presents us with opportunities if when people come into our homes, they know we are a household that follows God. God will provide us opportunities like that to share the faith. So how do we teach people to serve the Lord? by our personal example, by our words, by our admonitions, by our reminders of the right way to be. We teach them, especially our children, to worship when they see us worship, when they watch us pray, when we bless meals before we eat, when we say prayers before we go to bed. We raise up generations by our sacramental practice, by confirmation. We speak of God's goodness in age-appropriate ways from the first moments children are able to talk. John Wesley had um, kind of a, a cute section of this sermon where he was talking about how we might speak to a child because he believed as soon as a child could utter any words, they were developing the ability to reason. And this is a paraphrase of a conversation that he would have with a child if it was up to him. And it goes like this. Ask a child to look up. Ask them, what do you see? And they respond, the sun. And then you say to them, see how bright it is. Feel how warm it shines upon your hand. Look how it makes the grass green. But God, even though you can't see him, is above the sky and is even brighter than the sun. God that makes the grass and the flowers grow and makes trees green and grows fruit on the trees so you can eat it. Think what he can do. He can do whatever he pleases. He can strike me or you dead in a moment. But he loves you and he loves it when you do good things. God loves to make you happy, so you should love him too. Now, I have to confess. I mean, I'll never be John Wesley, but if I was having that conversation, I would leave out the sentence about he could strike you dead too. At least with a young, young child. I think we could probably leave that for later in life. But as I've worked here at St. Paul, I have seen Miss Katie talk to ch children and the preschool teachers and Miss Monica and Miss Joe teach the preschool children using words that are age appropriate. They are masters of it. And something miraculous happens when those children are raised up that way. Katie used to be a child in this church. Now she is raising up new children, and she is empowering people that Allison has trained in student ministry to become camp counselors and helpers. And so what we see is students who are still learning about God are starting to teach younger children about God. 
This generational thing goes on and on and on, and it's so important. We spend so much of our time creating our successors without even realizing it. And one of the great blessings of doing this is that in creating a successor, in mentoring a follower, in raising up a new leader, we cultivate some of the most important relationships in our life. Relationships that last a lifetime, that have great meaning. So let's go back to Elijah and Elisha and talk about how their relationship ended, because it matters. Nowhere does it tell us how Elijah trained Elisha. There are no times where he speaks to him and gives him a, a rule book for being a prophet. We just know in 2 Kings there comes a time where we're told that it's almost time for Elijah to return to heaven or to go to heaven to be with God. And he and Elisha begin a journey and three or four times Elijah says to Elisha, I must go on here. The God, is, God is telling me to go here. You remain behind. But Elijah did not realize that Elisha was not going to obey. So let me read to you from 2 Kings uh, chapter 2. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here. The Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, this is Elisha replying, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? And Elijah replied, Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horse of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father! the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. The end of their time together let us know how their relationship had grown. Elisha was a devoted pupil, much more than a servant. Tearing his garment was a sign of mourning the loss of a man who he called, my father, my father. You know, we might think he was being greedy when he responded to Elijah's question about what can I give you, what can I leave you with, when he said, give me a double portion of your spirit. But that wasn't greed. He wasn't saying, give me twice as much as you have. The double portion in biblical times in the patriarchal society was the eldest son's inheritance. If a father had many children, many successors, if you will, the oldest son was to receive two-thirds. That was called the double portion. In effect, Elisha was saying, let me be your primary heir. He was acknowledging that he would carry on Elijah's work. The relationship of master and servant had matured. It reminds me of some of the endearing words that the Apostle Paul spoke to Timothy or to Titus. And if you want to see the kind of relationship that a mentor can have with a mentee, then read First and Second Timothy or read Titus. The question, the questions I have to leave you with today is, what have we learned from Elijah? We've learned that God protects us and provides for us. He empowers us to have victories that are beyond our ability to do alone. He remains present with us in wilderness times. But he also calls us to live in to his calling to be in ministry for all of our days, even when the seasons of our lives change. Elijah provides an example for us of life's ups and downs. He did his mission. He encouraged the people away from Baal and toward God. And then he identified a successor who would go on to do some very hard things that Elijah had never gotten to. But this isn't just an Old Testament concept. Jesus said some words to his disciples when he was speaking to them about the vine and the branches. 
and they are instructive for us today. So let me finish today with this verse from John 15, verses 16 and 17, where Jesus said, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. I chose you to go bear fruit that would last. Is there any more lasting fruit than raising up a godly child, a successor who would carry on ministry after we're gone? Jesus was talking about building the kingdom. He was talking about making disciples of Jesus Christ for transformation of the world by transforming our communities into places that looked like little kingdoms of God and by transforming individuals into the likeness of Jesus Christ. We're called to pass on the faith and our legacy in that regard matters and we need to remember it every day. We need to teach others to love God and love their neighbor and we need to prepare successors who will lead when we are no longer able to lead. So let's make a commitment to be like Elijah. Let's identify our successors. Let's train them in the Lord's ways. Let's have our households serve the Lord. Let's bear fruit that will last.